Kellen Winslow II was a promising tight end, played for Miami, had a great pedigree, headed to the NFL with high hopes and expectations of becoming one of the next great players at his position. But fast forward to March 2021, just a couple of weeks before we recorded this episode, Winslow was sentenced to 14 years in prison. We'll tell you about what he did and give you all the details on this episode of Distant Replay. This is Distant Replay. So today's show is a listener suggestion, Kellen Winslow the second. So my sent it in to us, we, and we appreciate all the requests we've gotten. We've actually done a few shows already based on listener requests, but we got this idea. And Mike, I think, you know, immediately it was one that we put on our list, right? Because everybody remembers Kellen Winslow, some his, his play on the field, his I'm a soldier comment, like people are well aware of Kellen Winslow the second, but we wanted to really wait a little bit before we launched this episode and that was essentially to wait for finality in the case, right? Exactly. Yeah, we've gotten this suggestion from multiple people. Again, like Ben, just reiterate what Ben said. Thank you for all the suggestions that come in. Yeah, I knew there was going to be some finality to this case here sometime in 2021. Uh, things got delayed with this case because of COVID, most notably his sentencing. So now that we have finality to it, which came literally last week on March 3rd, I thought now would be a good time to talk about it. Well, you can find everything that we do, all of our past episodes online, distantreplaypodcast.com. Uh, connect with us on Twitter and Instagram, but also on YouTube. We're building out a pretty nice channel there. Um, and actually, this is where we got this recommendation from. So if you don't follow us on YouTube, please subscribe, leave us a comment, send us a, a person or a story of interest that you have, and we'll put it on the list. So let's jump into Calvin Winslow a second, because I'm very, very interested in this story, because I think like, uh, like a lot of people, very well aware of him and remember him kind of being in the news for some, for the crimes that he committed. But I probably speak for a lot of people to say that I just kind of lost track of him. Like I haven't paid attention to him in about three or four years, probably. So I'm very curious how this story plays out. But as we always do, let's start with the beginning, his early life, his early career. All right. So he attended high school in San Diego. And if you know the name Kellen Winslow, you know, his father was a hall of fame tight end played for the San Diego chargers. So he grew up in San Diego where his dad was a star. And his dad, I think it's important to put in context, his dad is why people, why Kellen Winslow Jr., I think, lived such a public life and why he was on everyone's radar relatively early in his college career and even late in high school. So his father, before Tony Gonzalez, Rob Gronkowski, Travis Kelsey, George Kittles of the world, I think it's pretty much a consensus that Kellen Winslow, Kellen Winslow Sr. and Ozzie Newsom were like the tight ends that we thought of prior to this wave of tight ends as being like those pass catching threats that just like terrorized defenses. Is that, is that, is that safe to say, Ben? Yeah. They kind of revolutionized that position essentially. Exactly. So Kellen Winslow Jr. Now goes to high school in San Diego, parlays that being very good on the field there to going to the university of Miami. Now we talked about this era of Miami football a lot on this podcast. If you guys, follow it you know i follow my i follow miami still but back then even more so he goes to miami in the early 2000s he's a part of a freshman class that included frank gore antrell roll and sean taylor yeah pretty good yeah so his freshman year was they, they won a national championship that's still when jeremy shockey was there though his sophomore year he b becomes a starter it's the year they lost to ohio state in the national championship game. We did that game here for the podcast. His junior season, his numbers dipped, but he was a unanimous first team All-American, okay? okay? Unfortunately for him, I don't think anyone really remembers anything he did on the field at Miami. I think people remember the I'm a soldier controversy, mm -hmm. which came in a game after 2003 versus Tennessee, where he went on this whole rant about the Tennessee players trying to take his knees out and he wasn't gonna allow it because he was a soldier. And he just went on this odd rant. Right. Okay. Yeah. Remember that. So nonetheless, that doesn't hurt him in the draft. He's drafted sixth overall, which is very high for a tight end. He has a leg injury in 04, a C is involved in a serious motorcycle accident in 05. Couple that with a staph infection that led him to missing time as well in, in 2005. So his first two years of his career are basically a wash. Yeah. In 06 and 07, he has good seasons with the Browns. Um, he ends up getting traded to the Buccaneers in 2009 for a second and fifth round pick. He signs a six-year, $36 million contract with the Bucs. Good seasons with the Buccaneers in 09, 
10 and 11. He's released in 2012, signed and released by the Seahawks and the Patriots in 2012, is a member of the Jets in 2013, gets suspended for performance enhancers in 2013, and tries to make comebacks, but never latches on with another team after that. Okay. And to put a bow on the early life and career of Kellen Winslow, you have a guy who was very productive in college. And like I mentioned, he at least had five or six productive seasons in the NFL. But I think his career in college is marred by the I'm a soldier controversy. Mm -hmm. And his career in the pros, I think people think of that motorcycle accident, the leg injury, and the staph infection. That's all I think about when I think of Kellen Winslow. I had honestly forgotten he even had those good years with the Buccaneers. Yeah, I mean, you look, I mean, his career numbers, he almost had 500 catches and over 5,000 yards. So, I mean, he had a, he had a number of productive years, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think about the motorcycle, that's kind of the first thing I think of, but he was, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was one of those guys that, um, I think people thought of would be one of the great tight ends, right? He, he was one of those rare combinations. Like we see it a lot more now with the, that position so athletic and fast and, and is utilized a lot more, but he was one of those guys that kind of broke the mold, continue to break the mold of a tight end that likes to block and, you know, make short catches and a little lumbering and slow, but became like one of those guys that could get, could be a game changer at that position. Yeah. We were thinking it was going to be like the bridge between Tony Gonzalez and the prime of Tony Gonzalez and like Rob Gronkowski and Travis Kelsey was going to be Kellen Winslow. Yeah. Like he was going to be the tight end for this generation. And look, he was drafted sixth overall. So obviously pro right. scouts thought that as well. All right, so that is the early life and career of Kellen Winslow on the football field. Okay. Now let's get into his crimes. And I will agree with you, Ben. I knew he was involved in some stuff. I knew it involved older women, but wait till you hear what he did. I mean, it's so bizarre. And at the same time, he, he's a complete psychopath. Like, I don't know. We'll get yeah, into it. I, I'm curious too, because it's, because I don't think, has this story been in the news at all? And, and, and you know, you're telling me it just wrapped up right here, March 3rd, 2021. Has this, I mean, I, I feel like there's been zero coverage of this. There was in 2018, because a lot of this stuff sort of felt like it came out of nowhere. But since then, uh, there hasn't been much that I've seen until recently when he got sentenced. Yeah. Like I had no idea he was, he was, you know, the trial was like finishing up and he was being sentenced. Like I had no idea. Was no, no, he, the trial finished up and he was sentenced many months later. Okay, cool. Yeah. You, you'll see as it, when I go through. All right, let's hear it. All right. So first of all, in 2003, that's where his crime story starts. So Kellen Winslow is in a summer before his junior year at Miami. He meets a girl back home in San Diego at a party. Okay. Winslow's 19. She's 17. As the girl describes it, so what I'm going to do is go through the different incidents he was involved in and what the victims testified to at trial. Okay. Because he had five victims in all and four of them, from what I could piece together, testified at trial. All right. So June 2003, meets a girl at a party. He's 19. She's 17. They begin, they, they meet, they flirt, all consensual. They go upstairs to a bedroom. They begin to have sex. Another man comes into the bedroom and made her feel uncomfortable. Winslow supposedly wanted him in there. She was like, nah, I'm not really into this. She leaves the bedroom, leaves the party. He didn't fall, force himself on her in this incident. She just found it really strange, the whole scenario. A little bit later in June, the same woman's at a party in San Diego again and alleges now that she was unconscious when Winslow and another man sexually assaulted her. She basically woke up with her head in the other man's groin area like literally in the middle of it. Imagine coming to it. And this is the moment yeah. you come to, you know, and she woke up in the midst of everything, started screaming for them to stop. And they eventually did. She said like Winslow wasn't stopping. And the friend had to like, basically pull him off of her to get him to stop. Hmm. Of note here is that she does not file charges. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to fast forward from this June, 2003 incident to an incident on March 17th, 2018. So 15 years yeah, later, many years later. Okay. A 54, 54 year old woman is hitchhiking. Now all of his, um, crimes took place in the San Diego area. Okay. okay. 54 year old woman is hitchhiking. She's a homeless woman. When a man picks her up, detectives will later say she was sexually assaulted by Winslow less than 4,000 feet from where she was picked up. When she testified at trial, she vividly remembered 
that it was Winslow who had done this to her. She remembered, you know, where Winslow took her, everything. She couldn't remember, though, what the name Winslow had used to refer to himself by. And that supposedly hurt her credibility a little bit at trial, which I didn't really understand why. But there were some other inconsistencies between what she told detectives and what she testified to. But she never wavered from the fact that she was sexually assaulted by Winslow. Okay? Okay. So that's, that's victim number two. Victim number three, May 13th, 2018. So two months after the first incident, a 59-year-old woman was hitchhiking, another homeless woman in San Diego, picked up by Winslow. Winslow, the difference in this one is Winslow knew this lady. He had given her rides before. He would check in with her. He would like basically drive by her on the street. She was homeless and say, hey, how you doing? Are you okay? Do you need anything? Then one day out of nowhere, Winslow asked her if she would exchange sex for money. She said no. Then... Again, out of nowhere, a separate incident. This, this incident happens on May 13th. He asked her if she wanted to go for coffee. So she says, yeah, sure, I'll go for coffee. This is what she testified to a trial. Like, yeah, I agreed to get in his truck and go out for coffee with him. Because, again, they knew each other. He starts to drive, and she's like, well, this is where the coffee shops are, and he's going a completely different way. So she began to wonder, like, what was going on. She said he parked his truck, went over to her side where she was sitting on the passenger side, and basically sexually assaulted her right in the front seat of his truck. She tried to yell. When she did that, he choked her and basically threatened to kill her if she yelled again. Hmm. All right. A very, very kind of um, dramatic moment in the trial was the defense tried to paint her as someone who was out for money. That's why she was alleging this crime against Winslow. Yeah. And she basically said, yelled back at the defense attorney, uh, sorry, yeah, the defense attorney, saying yes to coffee doesn't mean saying yes to rape. Hmm, man. And that supposedly stuck with the jury a lot. All right. So now we have these two incidents involving the two homeless women. Remember, they were reported on March 17th and May 13th. Right. So these, these are being investigated by police here. Okay. On May 24th, 2018. So 11 days after the, the sexual assault incident that I just went through. Mm -hmm. A 57-year-old woman is gardening when she alleges Winslow just exposed himself to her. She was gardening. He walked right over to her and did his thing right That's in her front lawn. So weird. So strange. She testified that she knew it was Winslow. Like she, she identified him. She saw him. But when she realized what was happening, she like couldn't look at him. Like she right, was yeah. so like devastated by what was, yeah. what was happening, uncomfortable. I mean, this happening in her front lawn when she's gardening. The next two incidents for Winslow happen on June 1st and June 7th of 2018. They both involve Winslow breaking in to mobile homes in a retirement community. In one incident, he broke into a woman's home. Basically, the woman like caught Winslow. They basically stared each other down, and he turned around and left. <laughs> Another incident six days later in the same, in the, in the same senior community that he was arrested on suspicion of burglary because law enforcement said he entered the home of an 86 year old woman with the intention to sexually assault her. When the person who reported the crime to police confronted Winslow, he said, quote, he was looking for a red dog named Clifford. This is just completely odd behavior. I mean, it, 86 year old woman and Clifford, the big, big red dog. And we're, and we're talking about all the incidents other than the one with the woman, the woman in the, in the, uh, who, where he came into her laundry room. Yeah. He, she didn't, she didn't like press charges or anything. She didn't feel threatened. She said, she just said like, this is like really strange. And this is the guy who did it. Okay. Yeah. But the lady with the second one, with the 86 year old woman with the Clifford story does file charges and he's arrested on suspicion of burglary on June 9th. His publicist comes out and says like, that June, that June 7th incident with the 86-year-old with the Clifford the Big Red Dog was a big misunderstanding. And that Winslow was in the mobile home park looking for a home for his mother-in-law. And that the 86-year-old woman and Winslow were friends. Just like, again, a bizarre kind of thing to say for the publicist to say. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like she just took Winslow's version of the story and repeated it to reporters. Yeah. So now on June 15th, he's arraigned for... All of the all of the crimes I just outlined. So 
there's an investigation going on with Win on Winslow from the March incident to the, the latest June 9th incident um, where he was arrested, where he, when he was arrested on suspicion of burglary. He's arraigned for the rape of the two homeless hitchhikers, exposing himself to the lady gardening, and suspicion of burglary in the incidents with the 71-year-old and the 86-year-old. Victims range in age from 54 to 86, and if convicted on all of these charges, he's facing life in prison. Hmm. Law enforcement came under criticism at this point, Ben, because, and they never really answered as to why, like he was allowed to roam so long after all these charges were being actively investigated. We kind of, feel like, I feel like that's a common thing, right? Like, yeah, we saw that happen with the Darren stories. Sharper incident. Do you remember that? Yeah. When we did Darren Sharper, very similar. I mean, Sharper's incidents were all over the country. Um, these are centered around, you know, one city, yeah. one greater area of one city, um, which maybe makes it a little bit more surprising that there seems to be a pretty clear pattern here um, of him being accused of whether it's sexual assault or exposing himself to people. Um, and, you know, just thought it was worth noting law enforcement did come under some criticism, but and he ended up getting arraigned on June 15th. July 12th, the judge orders him to stand trial for all the five charges that I just outlined. And also later that day, which comes as a surprise to a lot of people, he's formally charged from that 2003 incident. Remember that 2003 incident I started this yeah. all with? Yeah. All right. So since the victim in that case was a minor, there's no statute of limitations. So he can be tried for that sexual assault as well. Just on that charge, he's facing, facing 15 years. So now he's has all these charges pending. On July 13th, he's released on bail pending trial. On October 15th, he's officially ordered to stand trial on the 2003 incident. Winslow comes out on October 30th and says the allegations against him are a money grab, and that's all they are. He said that pretty consistently, and that's what his defense lawyers would consistently say at trial as well, is that all these women were out for money. In November, both sexual assault charges from the homeless victims and the 2003 incident are combined into one, and Winslow pleads not guilty. Okay. Now, this is an, another bizarre twist to this story. So we're now into 2019 and the month of February, so early 2019. Winslow is out on bond. He's been out on bond since, since July, okay? A woman alleges in two separate incidents in February of 2019, two incidents 10 days apart at a gym that Winslow attended. Winslow's accused of exposing himself and masturbating in front of a 77-year-old woman at the gym. One time, he exposed himself while she was on a uh, machine, like a, a, um, a Nautilus machine. And the other time, he exposed himself and masturbated when they were both in the gym hot tub together. Same woman. A woman, you know, she testified basically to the to something to the effect of, you know, wh why did this happen to me and why did it happen twice? Right. Like, like you know, like just devastated about what happened. And trauma, very, as you can imagine, when she testified, very, very traumatizing experience for her. In response to those incidents, in February, February 28th of 2019, he's placed on house arrest after that, those incidents happen at the gym. So they basically say, hey, look, you're out on bond, but until we figure this all out, like, you're not allowed to leave your house, <laughs> mm. you know? Yeah. So the judge reviews, the judge reviews the accusations from the gym and says on March 5th, like, you got to go back into custody. Like, we can't even have you out on the streets anymore. No more bail. You're back into custody because of, you know, uh, these indecent exposure incidents that happen at the gym. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's in jail, May 20th, opening statements start in his trial. Over the two week period of his trial, like I said, the victims testify and they testify to a lot of the things, you know, that I went over here when I described the different incidents. The jury begins deliberating on June 5th. Okay. On June 10th, 2019, they reach decisions on four of the 12 counts. He's found guilty of, of sexual assault on victim number two. That is the, been the homeless lady who he invited for coffee that yeah. he knew previously. He's also found guilty of indecent exposure on victim number three. That's the lady who was gardening. Guilty of one count of lewd conduct on victim number five. That's the lady at the gym. 
but not guilty on the other count of lewd contact, lewd conduct with the same victim. Okay. So the other eight counts, they can't come to a consensus on the jury. So the jury declares a mistrial on all those other eight charges. Mm-hmm. Now, they shortly announced shortly after in the coming days, the this, this state basically says, look, we're going to try him again on all these eight charges. Like, we're not letting him get away with this. We're going to try him again. It was a mistrial. We're going to try him again. On November 5th, 2019, he decides to plead guilty to sexually assaulting the teen in 2003 and to sexual battery of the first hitchhiker in a deal that spared him life in prison. So he says, I'll plead guilty to sexually assaulting the girl in 2003 and to sexual battery of the first hitchhiker as long as I don't have to serve life in prison. And the prosecutors decide that's a, that's a plea they're willing to take. Okay. All right. Also coming from that is saying that Winslow will be sentenced to between 12 and 18 years in prison, right? As a, a, that's a part of the deal there. Now, I'm pretty sure due to COVID reasons that that's the reason why we went from November 5th, 2019, where he pleaded guilty to what I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. We go between then and March 3rd, 2021, just last week when he was formally sentenced. So on March 3rd, 2021, he's formally sentenced to 14 years in prison for two sexual assaults, sexual battery, indecent exposure to the lady gardening, and committing the lewd act to the person at the gym. So when you take in totality everything he did, most of the incidents happening in 2018, the one incident happening in 2003, that's where Kellen Winslow ended up from a sentencing perspective, 14 years in prison. Wow. It's not, not I mean, you look back on it, it doesn't seem like a lot considering that life was squarely on the table. And especially since, like I mentioned, the, he could have gotten 15 years just for the incident with the minor in 2003. Yeah. Jeez. That's a so wild think, story, man. Like, I, it just, it do, like, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And, and, and many of these things, you know, like, you can't connect with them, right? It, it, in mo- for most people. Right? You don't know why somebody would be motivated to commit whatever crimes they do. But this, just everything about this just seems very, very bizarre and unlike kind of like any other story we've gone through yet. His behavior just seems very erratic. It's like, it's like calculatingly erratic. Yeah. On, on one hand, he's walking up to a, a lady gardening and exposing himself. And on the other hand, he's grooming that second hitchhiker, getting to know her, befriending her, then out of nowhere, asking her if she'll exchange sex for money and then sexually assaulting her, you know? Right. It, 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 it's just very, very bizarre behavior. And I know people, because he's a football player, they're going to point to CTE. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really like to, to, to put all the blame on that when we really don't know. We have to take exa- his actions for what they were. And they were yeah. disgusting. I mean, and they were vile and any word you want to use to, to, you know, to describe any terrible word you want to use to describe it. Just bizarre and, and very, very er- calculatingly erratic was the best thing I could come up with. So that puts him at, what, 50, about 51 years old when he's due out of prison. So 20, what does that put us, 2035-ish. So not 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 much longer, and he'll still have quite a bit of life ahead of him. So, yeah, I, I don't know, Mike. This is a, it's just, again, I hadn't paid any attention. Like, I kind of heard about some of this just in passing and, you know, maybe caught a headline or two. But it's like equally parts, it seemed like it happened a long time ago, a lot of these stories. But it's crazy to hear that it's only 2018 when it happened. It feels like it was a while ago, but it also feels like he wasn't playing that long ago. Like it's his his timeline is and his career is kind of a it just kind of exists in this weird place for me. Like just thinking back on it, because I don't feel like he was he was playing 20 years ago, right? It feels like he was playing 10 years ago, and then all this stuff just the the whole thing's just odd from start to finish. But it's interesting to kind of hear how it all played out, and you know, still. Still glad we went through it and and took these recommendations to kind of catch up on this because he was such a big player and so many people are familiar with him. Yeah, he's 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 a household name. I mean, even you know, never mind. He's going to be a household name for a completely different reason now. Um, He's one of the more higher higher profile names that we'll do on here on this true crime sports series. And again, just thought it was one worth covering because of the finality the finality to the case that happened last week. 
Yeah, no question. Well, if you have a show that you want us to to focus on and, and a story and a person or an event that comes to mind or you'd like to learn more about, send it to us. You can connect with us on our website or on Twitter, Instagram, or on YouTube. If you're listening to this right now and have a thought, just leave us a comment below. And while you're there, please uh, hit that subscribe button. We'd appreciate that. Help us keep growing as we look to pass 2,000 subscribers on the channel, Mike, which has been a pretty awesome journey so far. It's been, it's been an awesome journey. We, we, we love the feedback. We love interacting with you guys and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing what you think about this episode and beyond. No question. So hit subscribe. We'll have another episode coming up soon. We're trying to get on the schedule about three per week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, we got second job or real, a actual job. So that timeline might slide from time to time, but uh, hit subscribe and look forward to that next episode coming out soon. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ben. Until next time.